What do you envision as the future of architecture now? The future of architecture is the future of the human race. The two are one. If humanity has a future, it is architecture as a basic element in its culture. And if it has no future, no architecture. Why Frank Lloyd Wright now? What can an architect thinker born 150 years ago tell to a young generation of architects responsible for the invention of the future? The problems the young generation confronts are colossal. Today, the world population is about 7.2 billion likely to become 10 billion by mid-century. By then, the babies born today will be in their 30s. The planet will need, in addition to affordable housing, schools, services, and infrastructure. don't have much faith in the mob, and yet I'm told that you have a good deal of faith in the nation's youth. I do. How do you square one with the other? Why, is the nation's youth a mob? Is it not? No. I believe the teenager is the teenager, and uh, I think with him lies the hope of the future. Now, architecture with us is a matter of the future. We don't have it now. We haven't had it yet to any very great extent. Now, when they're a few years from now, 15, who are going to build the buildings of the country? The mob. The teenagers, they're not the mob. How did we enter into Wright's world? Here's our story. We were students in Rome and were fortunate to have two great teachers. Professor Bruno Zevi, one of the greatest critics of architecture and one of the few that Wright had respect for and Luigi Pellegrin, a genial visionary who told us, study right for six months and you will get an architectural education. This event of Napoli concludes the celebrations of the second centenary of the United States in the best way, that is, honoring e sottoponendo ancora una volta allo studio, all'attenzione degli studiosi e degli artisti europei, il più grande genio che abbia prodotto la nazione americana e in effetti forse il più grande genio dell'architettura di tutti i tempi. Premio Ludovico Quaroni alla carriera all'architetto Luigi Pellegrin. Importante è stato il suo contributo diretto alla cultura architettonica. Il cambiamento, secondo lei, è sempre il miglioramento? L'architettura non dipende dall'ambizione degli altri. Il cambiamento dipende non da noi, dipende da voi. We crossed the Atlantic to make a Wright's pilgrimage. 
that took us to over 100 of Wright's work throughout 25 states. The photographs shown here are just a token sample of the thousands taken during our trip. Both Wright and Pellegrin influenced our work as architects later on. He would work all day and all night, and sometimes he would go for three or four days continuously, working and developing drawings for just one project. Drawing after drawing after drawing. And this would go on all the time, continually. This is where he was developing his grammar. This is in the Oak Park days. He was really getting it down, getting what it was that he wanted to do, how he wanted to move with architecture. I grew up in a, in a house based on a hexagonal plan, and I had never known a 90 degree angle until I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> and I was amazed at what a, um, how that changed my perceptions. But um, we'll see. The question is, are we going to do anything about it? We bring out our stuff to talk about Frank Lloyd Wright and the evolution of organic architecture and, and ecological design and the different ways that we, different uh, palette we have right now that we can create uh, new patterns of living that, uh, that have beauty in them, but also have some of this technology and have some future, uh, some future aspects that we really, you know, we really think about the future when we do these buildings uh, so that we can, we can have a better life for everybody in the future after we're all out of here. You may know that my father um, admired Wright and uh, came to the United States in the 20s. And uh, Wright made an exception for him. He said, Mr. Neutcher, I will pay you $130 a month, which I usually don't pay anybody to come and work with me. But come and join me at Talgates. Oh, you didn't feel strange about when you were his life. His heart was just wide open. So how long were you there? I was there a couple of years. And I, my most memorable some of them, learning how to milk a cow. 
and the, the, the cats are always there to get squirted on. Do you have one favorite Frank Lloyd Wright building mm -hmm. object? Well, you know, there's a thing. Was it falling what, water? What was well, it no, turned you on? Well, there's, a, there's lots of different things. The thing that you're drawn to is that his buildings are simultaneously monumental and intimate. And I've never seen that in any other building. You go into the Guggenheim, you've seen the pictures, and you go in, and your first impression is, wow, it's smaller than I thought. You take two steps, and you go, it's huge. There's a kind of intentionality in his gestures that are great, and they're there in every building, from the private houses, the textile houses in California are great, four or five houses he did there in the 1920s. But for me, there's nothing more sublime than walking into the Johnson Wax Building in Racine, Wisconsin, which is essentially an office yeah. space. It is a cathedral, a temple. It wakes you up. It is, a, it is, Philip Johnson, our film, says it may be the greatest space in America. And I have to agree to him. When I walked into there, I, my heart sang. It, 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 it leapt. And I've never had a building do that in exactly that same way, where it wasn't just that you were looking at a great art the way you might admire the brush strokes in a Rembrandt, but like a Rembrandt. It was asking you questions about yourself. It was demanding something of you, something, as Lynn said, higher. And there can be no greater human purpose to art than that. What is it you, after such study, found most interesting and fascinating about him? Well, for me, I think it was the process of constant revelation of going into every different, unique Frank Lloyd Wright space. It's something we struggled with in terms of making the film, how to convey what it's like to be in these extraordinary places, the Guggenheim, the Unity Temple, some of the homes. And the fact is that you can never imagine, you can't anticipate what it's going to feel like. And when you even look at the outside of a building, you can't see what's inside, and it's always not what you expect. I feel like it sort of worked on me to the point that now I, when people ask me what, what's the lesson of the film and what's important about Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, I think what he's saying is that we have to expect more of our architecture. It can't just be a purely functional utilitarian space. It has to be something that gives us the possibility of something more, something higher. Until the 1960s, the world of architecture was influenced by few architects thinkers. Le Corbusier, Gropius, Buckminster Fuller, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Since then, the number of so-called star architects multiplied with many imaginative contributions, not necessarily organic. How would you like to change the way that we live? I would like to make it appropriate to the Declaration of Independence, to the center line of our freedom. I'd like to have a free architecture. I'd like to have architecture that belonged, where you see it standing and was a grace to the landscape instead of a disgrace. And the letters we receive from our clients tell us how those buildings we build for them have changed the character of their whole life and our whole existence that is different now than it was before. Well, I'd like to do that for the country. Organic architecture flourished after Wright. There is no substitute to immersing yourself into his buildings and to reading his prolific writing. Wright's 150th birthday offers an opportunity to rethink Wright and to see which of his many ideas can provide a solid foundation for the world of tomorrow. We hope they may continue to inspire others. answer to just one more question. Go ahead. Are you afraid of death? Not at all. 
Walt Whitman, uh, Walt Whitman is the guide on that. If you want to talk, consult him, read him. Do you Death believe, is a great friend. Do you believe in person, in your personal immortality? Yes. You believe in so far as I am immortal, I will be immortal. To me, young has no meaning. It's something you can do nothing about. Nothing at all. But youth is a quality. And if you have it, you never lose it. And when they put you into the box, that's your immortality.